So good morning, my name is Malcolm West. I'm an NIHR clinical academic uh, working in the University of Southampton and I'm also a general surgical colorectal trainee uh, in Wessex in the UK. And within the next half hour I'll be talking to you about cardiopulmonary exercise testing or CPET and prehabilitation in the perioperative setting. Um, so there are about 4 million surgical procedures performed annually in the United Kingdom with a various morbidity and mortality uh, ranging up to 25% in morbidity. 12% of these patients are already labelled as high risk individuals and 83% and of those are responsible for total mortality and length of hospital stay. Um, when considering rectal cancer resections, the published morbidity can be up to 40%. When looking at epidemiological literature, um, there is a very strong link between surgical morbidity and reduced survival. Um, in the surgical literature, however, there is poor reporting for this morbidity. So for us surgeons and perioperative physicians, uh, the major challenge is to identify these high-risk individuals and optimise their post-operative course. So when looking at a cardiopulmonary exercise test, uh, this is uh, a figure taken from Principles and Practices of Exercise Physiology, um, edited by Carl Wasserman from UCLA, and essentially it shows that we measure oxygen uptake at um, oxygen uptake and uh, oxygen uh, and carbon dioxide output at the mouth using a cardiopulmonary exercise test. And this is uh, tracked all the way um, down the oxygen cascade into the mitochondria which are the site of interest. And this test has been popularised in the 1990s by Professor Paul Older in Australia and it is, very, uh, it is now gold standard to uh, link in physical fitness and stratify uh, risk for perioperative outcome. Um, and in, in his seminal paper, Paul Older in Cheston of 1983, he said that low physical fitness determined by CPET is linked to poor patient outcome. As you can see from the picture, um, this is a, an elderly gentleman with uh, advanced rectal cancer waiting for his operation. He is undergoing a CPET test um, and he is currently pedaling on an exercise bike and is attached to uh, non-invasive blood pressure monitoring, or, or arterial saturations, uh, at full 12 ADCG and a tight-fitting mask to uh, measure his oxygen uptake and carbon dioxide output. So CPET is defined as a non-invasive graded exercise challenge which is performed on a cycle ergometer. It can also be performed on an arm crank or a treadmill. However, in patients who are, uh, who are uh, waiting for an operation, I think cycle ergometry is much better as it's weight supported. Uh, this allows the objective assessment of physical fitness and at rest and under stress, mimicking the stress of major surgery. And in the literature in the last 10 years, there have been a flurry of papers looking at the optimal predictors between different surgical types. Um, we've looked at the op oxygen uptake at lactate threshold uh, or the anaerobic threshold with the magic number of 11 milligram mils per kilo per minute uh, in major intra-abdominal surgery. We've also looked at the oxygen uptake at peak and the ventilator equivalents for carbon dioxide which are indicative of a perioperative uh, risk and can stratify um, according to outcome. So what is prehabilitation? Prehabilitation has been popularised by the Montreal group, um, the Carly group in Canada, and this is a form of exercise training that is aimed to prevent injuries before they actually happen. Uh, we prehabilitate from uh, before major surgery, before thoracic, abdominal or orthopaedic nowadays, and after neoadjuvant cancer therapies. And why prehabilitate? I mean, we Traditionally, as surgeons, we have focused on uh, the post-operative recovery process and intervening after and around the major surgical event uh, using the enhanced recovery pathways. And this is one of the paper, one of the papers uh, from the Monson Group in Hull, looking at a systematic review and meta-analysis of this. Um, however, the preoperative period uh, may be a more emotionally salient time to intervene, as patients can be actively engaged in their operative recovery and in their operation. Rehabilitation has been done for decades in, in heart failure patients, in post-MI patients, and also in, in, in respiratory patients post-COPD exacerbations. However, the evidence is quite scanty. We have published 
a review in best practice and research clinical anesthesiology in 2011 and we have published a, uh, a systematic review in the BJA of 2013 um, looking at this evidence. These are two other papers uh, by Valknit in 2010 and by Singh in 2014 uh, in Western Australia looking at the pre-surgical exercise interventions in a cancer population. This is one of our tables in, in our recent BJA paper um, that shows there are very small number of patients in about 10 uh, randomized control or observation trials with a number of about 520 patients. These studies we thought were badly designed, lacked power, however their intervention improved fitness. And why have we been doing this in the UK? Our, th this is my experience uh, that we've been doing uh, prehabilitation since 2010 um, and this is the experience of the Fitness for Surgery Consortium led by Professor Mike Rocott in Southampton. Our aim was initially to look at CPED variables and predict their in-hospital morbidity in patients undergoing major colonic and rectal surgeries. We have different papers which I'll show you looking at colonic surgery, both benign and malignant, uh, rectal cancer surgery and uh, colorectal and upper GI cancer patients after their chemotherapy interventions. This is one of our first papers, the colonic uh, surgery paper. These are 133 patients, both benign, benign and malignant group. And as you can see from the receiver operator curves, uh, the, cuts, the cutoff for oxygen uptake at lactic threshold and at peak are similar to the published literature, around about 10 or 11 for the anaerobic threshold and 16 for peak, which have a, a good uh, sensitivity and specificity and relate to in-hospital in short-term outcome. We then looked at a risk prediction model for these colorectal patients and we can see that if you're a male, uh, you have a 4.5% chance of, uh, of, of morbidity post-surgery. Uh, if you have an oxygen uptake of, of around 11 and you, can, uh, you are able to increase that by one point, you can reduce your odds ratio by 25%, so your risk declines by 25%. If you are able to improve that by 2 mg per kilo per minute, your, your risk of uh, in-hospital morbidity falls by about 40%. Um, the operation type is also important and with patients having an open resection uh, this goes up by twofold. We can look at a multivariable model and the risk prediction model is currently now used in, in Aintree Hospital in Liverpool uh, based on gender, anaerobic threshold and operation type and this gives a better sensitivity and specificity and a better prediction when looking at in-hospital morbidity. This is the paper from the BJA in 2014, which I encourage you to read. When looking at rectal cancer surgery, these are uh, rectal cancer patients only um, with having uh, a major surgical uh, operation. And as you can see, the sensitivity and specificity around the measurements are, is much increased. So the CPET test is more predictive in rectal cancer surgery, we think. Um, this is another risk uh, prediction model which we use and, and based around uh, the anaerobic threshold and the oxygen uptake at peak uh, and these are quite staggering numbers so we're saying here that if you are above the median of 11 uh, mils per kilo per minute in your anaerobic threshold your odds ratio or your risk declines by about 95 percent whilst if you can improve your VO2 peak by one point your risk reduction is 25 percent um, and this is reflected by the kaplan meier curve for length of hospital stay in that um, if you have a complication your length of stay is much longer, almost double, as opposed to people having no complications. And this is the paper, the citation from the BJS in 2014. What about patients undergoing neoadjuvant cancer treatment? So we've looked at two groups. This is an upper GI uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy group. We, these are 38 patients um, tested both pre-chemotherapy and post-chemotherapy uh, and having a six-week course of uh, platinum-based uh, chemotherapy compounds. And as you can see, there is a, a clinically and statistically significant reduction in their physical fitness by about two milligrams per kilo per minute, which is uh, quite acute in a, in a six-week period. 
If you can see, if you can look at the Kaplan-Meier plots, uh, if you are a fit group above the magic number of 14 in this case, you will live for longer as opposed to being below the cutoff point at one year. And this is the paper reflecting all, all the upper GI data published in the European Journal of, Clinical on of Surgical Oncology in 2014. We've done exactly the same with uh, neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy therapy in locally advanced rectal cancer patients and the, we've tested them pre and post chemoradiotherapy therapy within a six week interval. These patients received a standardized course of chemoradiotherapy, therapy and all these patients were T3 and plus circumferential resection margin threatened cancer patients. So quite advanced disease, however operable. And we've seen exactly the same thing that the lactate threshold or the anaerobic threshold has fallen by 1.5 mils, which is both clinically and statistically significant. And we've also published this paper in the European Journal of Surgical Oncology in 2014 for your reference. The take home messages from our Fitness for Surgery consortium um, are that you can, uh, or that oxygen uptake at lactate threshold or the anaerobic threshold and the oxygen uptake at peak exercise are independently related to five day post-operative morbidity, so in-hospital short-term outcome. Fitness declines with neoadjuvant cancer treatments, and these data are taken to be unique, strongly clinically meaningful and attainable when considering the use of a prehabilitation program in major cancer surgery. So how have we been doing this? This is our prehabilitation experience from the Fitness for Surgery Collaborative. This was well taken up by the BBC, and all these citations are freely available on, on the web. Um, these, are, these are very good articles published by the BBC World Service and I urge you to read them. Uh, they have quotes from a couple of our patients which are quite uh, emotionally touching. Um, as you can see also the Royal College of Surgeons both in Edinburgh and in England have launched their exercise campaign to reduce mortality by fivefold which I think is very salient in this climate. This is a recent um, press release from the University of Southampton looking at our prehabilitation program. So when considering the rectal cancer prehabilitation program, so my work in, in Liverpool and in Southampton, our aim was to evaluate the effect of, uh, of neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy and a six-week structured responsive exercise training program on CPET outcomes, namely VO2 at lactate threshold in these locally advanced rectal cancer patients. These are the methods, as you can see. These are 39 patients, which were all they all underwent uh, a CPET test um, at baseline. Within a week, they underwent standardized long-course chemoradiotherapy uh, for six weeks. And after that, they immediately undertook a CPET test again, which was considered week zero. They were then split into an exercise in a control group in a non-randomized control way. The exercise group um, included 22 patients. The control group included 13 and uh, they had exercise versus control for a six week group, for a six week period, um, and were followed up until their surgery at week 15. All these patients were, had standardized chemotherapy and had a standardized T3N plus circumferential resection margin threatened cancer. This is the training program. Um, uh, these patients underwent 18 sessions with three CPET tests embedded within the training program. The training program lasted for about 40 minutes, uh, three days a week for six weeks. And the adherence of this group was phenomenal, which was 94% for all CPET sessions, for all training sessions and CPET sessions with zero adverse events. This is a more in-depth look at the exercise training program. This was an interval training program with moderate and severe intensities based on the uh, cardiopulmonary exercise test at week zero. So this was all tailored medicine and the patients went exercise in a moderate in a moderate, um, uh, in a moderate, uh, in a moderate and severe strength intensity based around the lactate threshold. These are the visual outputs from the exercise bike. This, was, this is an, an Ergoline OptiBike. It's an essentially a bike that you can find in a gym. However, you can preload an exercise training program on a chip and pin card. Um, and you can, this is the visual output that the patient looks at on completing their exercise program with heart rate as an undulating baseline and the blocks of workload in the background. These are the patient characteristics for the rectal cancer patients. 
as you can see the control group was older um, were considered to be sicker and had a WHO performance status which was worse than the exercise group. This is a busy slide, we're looking at all the outputs from the cardiopulmonary exercise test and if you can look at the column on the right uh, which shows the significant, uh, the sig level of significance. Um, this is a, a compound symmetry covariance analysis which looks at the individual time points and compares pre-chemotherapy versus week zero versus week six with one p-value. And as you can see, um, we had statistically significant changes in anaerobic threshold, uh, oxygen uptake at peak, O2 pulse at lactic threshold, O2 pulse at peak, workload both at lactic threshold and at peak, and or we can also we have also found a significant reduction in heart rate, both at rest and at peak exercise. This is a graphic interpretation of, of that data, looking at uh, oxygen uptake at lactic threshold um, and between pre-chemotherapy, post-chemotherapy and week six. And as you can see, patients declined um, in, in their fitness, using, uh, losing uh, about 1.9 mils per kilo per minute. However, within six weeks, that, that was regained and the exercise group, which is the, the dashed line, uh, went back to the original baseline. However, the control group kept losing fitness. And exactly the same thing happened in, when considering oxygen uptake at peak. This is the change in fitness over the whole exercise program between, weeks, between week zero and week 14. You can see that patients improved um, as early as week three. In, in the exercise group and there was already a positive inflection in the, in the exercise group as, a, as a compared to the control group. The exercise group undulated and went back to baseline at week 14 when we operated on these patients. However, the control group unfortunately kept on losing their fitness and, and had a fitness which was, which was um, predicted to be, to be um, predictive of, of complications. These are individual patient data. Um, on the left, you can see uh, the oxygen uptake at lactate threshold between uh, post uh, chemotherapy and week six in the control group. And on the right, you can see the exact same for the exercise group. As you can see, you can split these patients into responders and non-responders. Um, there, there are either patients who have a good response to exercise or patients who don't have a good response to exercise. And maybe that's um, linked to our the exercise challenge that we've provided them with. This is a physical activity um, graph. We've given these patients a triaxial accelerometer, activity monitor, measuring all sorts of variables. However, the most, um, in the, the best variable to look at is the mean number of steps, which which has um, declined between pre and post chemotherapy. As you can see, these patients are baseline unfit with about 5,000 steps per day, um, as opposed to healthy human beings which should have a step count of about 10,000 steps per day. This has dropped between pre and post chemotherapy, um, and uh, as you can see, both the control group and the exercise group have regained their original uh, baseline activity. Uh, however, this is interesting when compared to the oxygen uptake uh, CPET variables in that the exercise stimulus provided to the exercise group has, is the only accountable force that drives their improvement in physical fitness and not their physical activity. You can read all this in the British Journal of Anesthesia in, in the February edition published in 2015. So what is the clinical relevance of all this? I think these, patient, these patients get a change in behaviour towards exercise which is well documented in both of our, page, both of our papers uh, when looking at their quality of life both objectively and subjectively. We have also looked at the effects of neoadjuvant chemotherapy in the same cohort uh, on mitochondrial function. This is a novel way of looking at in vivo mitochondrial function, looking at some, using something called a 31 phosphorus magnetic resonance spectroscopy, or 31 PMRS for short, and whole body CPET measures. Uh, we are the first group that has ever done this in a cancer population. Uh, as you can see from the pictures on the right, 
there is, uh, this patient has rectal cancer and is exercising within the bore of a, a three Tesla MR scanner with a phosphorus coil strapped to his right leg. And the phosphorus coil gives us something called uh, KPCR or phosphocreatinine reco recovery time constant, which is an in vivo measure of mitochondrial function. This can be easily related to oxygen uptake, both at peak and at uh, anaerobic threshold. And as you can see, um, this is a randomized controlled trial um, of n equals 12, and we've split these patients into the exercise group and the control group with exactly the same, um, with exactly the same exercise stimulus as previously. And you can see that the KPCR has declined between uh, pre-chemotherapy and post-chemotherapy which correlates very nicely to their VO2 at peak and their lact at lactic threshold. When these patients were, were split into the exercise group and the control group, you can see that on the left, in the exercise group, these patients have restored both their whole body oxygen uptake levels, and this has mirrored quite nicely with their KPCR function. So their mitochondrial function, within a very short period of time, has declined and then overshot the baseline as opposed to the control group who haven't had uh, any training and, and their KPCR is almost exactly the same, which mirrors quite nicely their oxygen uptake variables. And you can read this in a recently published paper in PLUS One in 2014. So in conclusion, preoperative exercise training is a valuable intervention to improve physical fitness post chemotherapy prior to major elective cancer surgery. Preoperative exercise training with different intensities and durations needs to be explored further. Added benefits and clinical relevance is the change of behavior that these patients have towards exercise in the long term, their improvement in quality of life and their improvement in activity levels which we have measured. This may have important implications in improving surgical outcome and we're looking at this using an upper GI cancer cohort and a lower GI cancer cohort, both observational and randomized controlled. Ho this is NIHR funded and hopefully the results will be out in 2016 as the trials will end this year. And there is a need to explore potential mechanisms for this decline in physical fitness with neoadjuvant cancer treatments and the improvement with prehabilitation also needs to be explored as we have no idea what the mechanistic driving force is um, behind that. Uh, these are my acknowledgements. I would like to thank the Fitness for Surgery Consortium, um, the University of Southampton, uh, our funding partners which are the NIA and the National Institute for Health Research. Thank you very much for listening.